In this video, I will walk you through character creation for the One Ring 2nd Edition. In the end, you should have a sheet that looks something like this. Off the start, the main two components to making your character is to pick a heroic culture and a calling. The available heroic cultures in the core rules are Bardings, Dwarves of Durin's Folk, Elves of Linden, Hobbits of the Shire, Men of Bree, and Rangers of the North. The available callings are Captain, Champion, Messenger, Scholar, Treasure Hunter, and Warden. For my character, I will be making an Elf Messenger. Write down any cultural blessings that are included on your heroic culture. Each culture has one blessing, and some have an additional, more negative feature. The Elves of Linden have Elven Skill and the Long Defeat. Elven Skill lets Elves spend hope points to achieve a magical success, instead of just getting a bonus to a roll. However, the Long Defeat means that Elves remove shadow points very slowly. After cultural blessings, write down the standard of living, which for the Elves is frugal. Standards of living dictate if your character starts with a horse or pony, how many useful items you can carry, what armor you can wear, and how much treasure you begin with. The amount of treasure you start with can be found on page 72. Next up is attributes. Each culture has a unique table that you can either roll a d6 on, or choose one that best fits your idea. These numbers will dictate how heavily weighted your character is towards strength, heart, and wits, the core attributes in the One Ring. If you aren't sure what you want your character to be best at, look at the skills listed below each core attribute. The skills directly below each core attribute are the ones associated with it. If you want more information on a given skill, they are explained beginning on page 60. I want my elf to be fairly even across the board, but leaning more on strength and wits, so I will choose the fifth option from the top, which will give me a 5 in strength, a 4 in heart, and another 5 in wits. Fill those numbers in on the rating diamond for each core attribute. The numbers you choose will flow directly into your derived stats, which are the diamonds below the ratings. Each culture has another unique table here that shows how to calculate the derived stats. For me, my strength rating plus 20 will give me my endurance, heart rating plus 8 for my hope points, and my wits rating plus 12 will decide my parry score. Endurance functions almost identically to hit points in many other games. Your hope gives you a number of points you can spend to help you in your adventures, although you risk becoming miserable if your hope drops too low. If that happens, when you roll an Eye of Sauron, the action fails regardless of the roll total. Your parry score is the number that adversaries will need to roll equal to or higher than in order to wear down your endurance. Now we will fill in the big diamonds that are your TNs, or target numbers. These are the numbers you'll be trying to roll equal to or higher than on all your skill checks and combat attacks. The lower these numbers are, the easier time you're going to have succeeding on your rolls. Your TNs are calculated by subtracting your relevant rating from 20, or if you are playing with a small group or for a short campaign, you can subtract from 18 instead. Once everything is in order for your core attributes, it is time to move on to skills. These are what you will be using to do most things in the game. Fill in the number of diamonds to the right of each skill that it says in the table with your culture. You'll notice that two of the skills are written in red. You can choose one of these and fill in the box to the left to make those rolls favored. When making a roll with any given skill, you always roll a d12, and then you can also roll as many d6s, or success die, as you have diamonds filled in. For skills with the box to the left filled in, you can roll two d12s, or feet die, instead of one, and keep the highest result. For any skills that have no diamonds, you just roll one feet die and hope you land on the g rune. Your skills will look a little bare at this point, but not to worry, you'll be able to fill in some more towards the end of character creation. Now you can fill in some diamonds next to your combat proficiencies, as shown in the table. My character will mainly use a spear, so I will fill in two diamonds there, and as my extra combat proficiency, I will take bows and only fill in one diamond. We're nearly done with your heroic culture. Choose two distinctive features. These don't have hard mechanical advantage and are more for role-playing, but your lower master can give you a bonus to rolls if your distinctive feature would be of help. For example, making an awe skill roll if your character is lordly. Each distinctive feature is explained more, starting on page 67. Finally, all you have to do is choose a name, and we can move on to callings. For my character, I will be choosing Messenger and naming him Elahir. Each calling will have three favorite skills, and you can choose two of these options and fill in the square to the left of that skill. Callings will also give you an additional distinctive feature that will give your character some knowledge that will help them in their calling. The last thing to write down for your chosen calling is your shadow path. This is another role-playing element that will come more into play if your hope falls too low. These can be developed further with the lore master, using some information starting on page 136. As mentioned earlier, now you can start filling in more of your skills. You have 10 points that you can spell on skills or combat proficiencies to further fill out what your character is good at. Make sure you look at the table on page 46 to see how much it costs each time you raise an ability. It's not as simple as one point per diamond. Once your character has all their skill and combat proficiencies filled out, you can get your character some more gear. For each weapon type that you have at least one diamond filled, you can start with that kind of weapon. In regards to armor, there's a bit of a confusing mistake in the book where it says favored selection of armor, helms, and shields. Characters can start with any armor or shield that they want, depending on your standard of living. See page 100 for more on that. There is nowhere in your character creation that gives you a favored set of armor. One thing to note before selecting all your war gear is that each item has an amount of load associated with it. Once your character is kitted out, tally up your load score and fill that in here. You generally want this number to be low. If your endurance is reduced to the same or less than your load score, your character becomes weary. When this happens, any 1s, 2s, or 3s you roll on a success die count as 0. 
so you may not want to go crazy and get all the heaviest armor and biggest weapons. Now that that's understood, let's go back to weapons for a bit. The damage number is a set amount that will be taken off your adversary's endurance on a successful attack, so no rolling for damage amount in the one ring. Mark down your weapon's injury rating. If you deal a piercing blow, your adversary will need to roll equal to or higher than the injury rating or become wounded. More on what all that means in my combat video. Basically, the higher this number is, the better. The first few options require a combat proficiency in brawling. Any player can use a brawling weapon and make that attack using their highest combat proficiency, but suffers a penalty of losing one success die. In regards to armor, the protection rating will influence how many dice you roll to avoid a wound when an adversary hits you with a piercing blow. Shields offer a parry modifier. You will add this number to your parry score. Once that is done, make sure you tally the load of all your gear and write that number down here. You'll also notice that there is a spot for fatigue. Your character will gain fatigue during the journey phase of the game, and this will temporarily raise your load score. Now we'll move on to useful items. In the One Ring, your character is assumed to have basic adventuring gear with them, and that is not calculated with load. However, based on your standard of living, you do get a certain number of useful items. There are some examples on page 50, but you can also come up with your own. I picture Ella here having a bottle of Miravar with him that can help him keep his strength up over long journeys. This may allow me to add 1d6 to travel rolls. Now, based on your standard of living, you may get to start the game with a horse or pony. I don't get one as an elf. If you do, be sure to give it a name and write down its vigor rating. There's no specific spot on your sheet for this, the traveling gear section would work well. The vigor rating of your mount will reduce fatigue when traveling. You are very nearly done making your character. You can now write a 1 in your Valor and Wisdom diamonds and pick one reward and one virtue. For Ella here, I will give him a Reinforced Buckler, which will increase my parry rating by 1, and Hardiness, which will increase my Endurance by 2. The final thing to fill out is your Fellowship score. This is equal to the number of members in your company, plus any bonuses granted by various virtues, a member's cultural blessings, or by the group's patron. Fellowship points can be spent during play to recover hope, among other things. You are now essentially done your character. As a company, you and your friends can now pick a patron, a safe haven, and a fellowship focus, or wait to fill that in during your adventures. There are six patrons that are included in the core rules, and they each come with different bonuses. A safe haven is where players will return to in between adventures. More patrons and safe havens can be added as your company explores the world. The last thing I will talk about in regards to your character is how to essentially level up. Players gain three skill points and three adventure points at the end of every session of play. Alternatively, this comes out to being about one skill point and one adventure point for every hour of play. During the fellowship phase, players can spend skill points to acquire new ranks in any skill, and adventure points can be spent to improve combat proficiencies or gain new ranks in Valor and Wisdom. Every time you gain a rank in Valor or Wisdom, you gain a new reward or virtue respectively. These can be from the starting rewards and virtues list, or culture-specific ones, explained starting on page 78. Remember that when spending skill and adventure points, the point costs are not the same that they were during character creation. The table on page 119 shows the new point costs. You're all done and ready to start adventuring. I hope you found this video helpful. If it was, check out my other videos on combat, journeys, fellowship phases, and councils. Once all those are done, I will probably add a video covering my thoughts on the One Ring as a whole. Thanks for watching!